Hey there, my name is Sean Taylor. That's my friend Chris Ford, the objective geek of YouTube and Twitter fame. Welcome to Avatar The Last Podcasters. And today we are going to rewrite The Legend of Korra Book 2 Spirits. And then we're going to send our script into all the directors in Hollywood and see which one of them picks it up and, and takes it and runs with it. No, uh, we are going to, let's say lightly, uh, or moderately suggest some changes that we feel might have made this the least of the Avatar seasons by most people's opinions. Maybe I will say a this is more interesting. I, this is very pretentious of us, no doubt, 100%. because we are not writers. We have never taken. Well, maybe you have, Sean. I have never taken like creative writing classes beyond high school. I have taken numerous, um, but I have learned that I am not creative is the <laughs> issue. The writing part is good. The creative part, not so much. Okay. All I'm saying uh, is our podcast has the guts to do this where other hyper-famous uh, official Nickelodeon podcasts mm, probably would never, they never would get never this critique. kind of edgy, edgy content on those podcasts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we're going to take it into our own hands. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I wouldn't probably, I wouldn't say dare. I wouldn't bother doing it for any of the other seasons, but I think this one is is probably universally. I think I think this season, one thing, I love the season. Um, there's some episodes that I hate, but I love the season. Love, I, love, I do. Do you I love, love a lot it of in the way it. that like humans are all supposed to love each other? No, 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 not at all. And I, also, I don't love all humans. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm like a four out of five. I'm a, I'm on a like for this season. Yeah. If every other season's a five, this one's a four out of five. Uh, I love the season. Um, I think, I think the just, scenes just need a little bit more polishing, right? So my, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm gonna go through and kind of rewrite it in my way. And I say rewrite, just but I'm really just pointing out things that would change. I'm not yeah. going to go full script by script type of deal. Um, in a very and, and say things on uh detailed, intelligent way. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll be a right. great conversation. Um, but my goal is to keep, kind of keep the ending the same, keep the general story the same, because if I go beyond that, then I'm just writing something completely different. And I'm not good enough at all to write something completely different. So I'm just trying to just build on top of it, add a few things, take away a few things. So I think make it a little bit more cohesive and make it um, oh, just just come off a little better. Yeah, that sounds perfect. And then uh, I will, at the end, I'm going to throw you a curveball at you, just like a real quick, like, this is Sean's idea. And it's a terrible <laughs> idea, but I'm going to throw mm -hmm. it at you anyway because I already put it in the okay. slides and it's too late. So Good. You know, I'll do that right at the end. It won't take long. But first... I do. Before we jump in, I just want to note uh, this is week two of three of maybe slightly, what was the, I forgot the word again, abbreviated episodes uh, due to holidays and vacations on my side. No fault of Chris's, so my own apologies. But week two of three of slightly abbreviated episodes. So this week, happy 4th of July, by the way. Be safe. Have a happy 4th of July. Uh, count your blessings, all that good stuff. And then. Next week will be abbreviated, and then the week after that we'll get back to normal. So, my apologies. Thanks for bearing with us. That's my disclaimer for this episode. So, Chris, whenever you're ready. All right. I'm going to go in somewhat chronological order on how the season starts. So, I think, first of all, the first thing that annoyed me with book two is that Cora was <laughs> annoying. And so, my biggest, my first big change will, will be make Cora less annoying. And... To that, to do that, I think you give her give her the issue of all the dark spirits and everything, but she can't solve it, right? She keeps just going forceful at them, forceful at them, and that's not solving it. So have her actually communicate with her past lives, and that would just be really cool just to see, because it will show that Cora is is trying everything she can to solve this issue, <clears throat> and we know that. None of them have any clue, really, what to do with dark spirits like this. Aang wouldn't have a clue. One thing, it would just be cool to see Aang again. So that will uh, really, all the Avatar diehard uh, nostalgia fans will love that, just seeing Aang talk to Korra again. Uh, and then talking to Roku, and then talking to um, Kyoshi. 
and and uh, get back to Cork. And Cork would be like, hey, I, I dealt with dark spirits and my life was shortened because of it. And another for you. <laughs> so that... Um, it's like, like, yeah, I, you're going to have a bad time. I yeah, know. like, oh, mm, you got to deal with dark spirits? Uh, I don't want to tell you, but that's why I only live to be 33. How old are you? 18? Well, you know, mm. you got, got another 15 years. Good. Better I mean, get working maybe. on that midlife crisis ASAP. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that one thing, that puts in that puts a... A, a dilemma in Cora's head, right? Of like, I got to do anything I can to do this, or I'm going to end up the same as Cork. Which one thing it, it does a good job of bringing back in Cork, I think. Granted, we didn't know <laughs> what we know about Cork now because it didn't exist then. And so, okay, that's kind of a hindsight 2020 type deal. But we still know that Cork dealt with like Co and stuff. Um, but still, either way, no one would know what to do about dark spirits. And, and then I she'll talk to, to not to in- interfere with your thought process here, but I wouldn't want to give away too much of what happens in the novel in, in this season still. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't either. I, I would just vaguely hint at it pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah vaguely hint at it. Um, and then, you know, then she'll go to Tenzin and she'll like, Tenzin, I talked to my past lives. Your dad has nothing to say about these dark spirits. What do I do? And then, Tenzin will be like, he wouldn't know either. <laughs> he has no idea. And also Tenzin is just so spiritually inept. And then here comes walking in um, her uncle, Winnelock. And and so she will, she will, instead of just dumping Tenzin, because that's the way it feels, that, that was the part I hated. Because those two grew so much over season one together. Then when she dumped him in season two, it felt like a betrayal of that character. And I think that's bad writing. And so this time she would dump him, but for a good reason. She's one thing she's probably scared of. She's scared of dying young. And when you're scared, you, you do things um, they probably wouldn't normally do. But this one thing, it makes sense that she would be like, Tenzin, I can't, it's, it's, it's not your fault, but I can't have you as a teacher. I need someone new. Like, thank you for everything you've given me. But, I have to I have to go my own. We have to go our own ways now, and so that will be a nice little heartfelt kind of goodbye. Tenzin will feel really low and, and down in the dumps on himself, like like that. That would make him feel even worse, right? Because before Cora dumped him, and you could just chalk that up to Tenzin could have just chalked it up to angsty teenage stuff. But then as Cora is actually the sensible one, she's making a lot of sense, and that he's not good enough to be her spiritual teacher. And so that's going to hurt him even more. <laughs> well, and in this, right. but in this situation you've described, he might even be a little more sympathetic to like the the dangers that she's facing by being uneducated. Even yeah. Tenzin might feel a little more sympathy toward it. Might might be you know, more of a mutual breakup. Yeah, yeah, it will be. But I think he, I think it could still be. It could, yeah, it could be a mutual breakup. But he'll still take it hard. Yeah. <laughs> he'll still take it like I'm supposed to be. This is sex, the successor to Avatar Aang's legacy, and I can't even help his his life, his his future life. Um, like so that that puts him in a good place to grow from there. Um, so then enter Unalak, and pretty much from there, things like the first five episodes or so kind of go the same way. I I think there's one episode in there that we really really liked. Um, so yeah, so those kind of mostly go the same way. Oh, there was another annoying thing she did with her her dad. And if I was, um, so as she's communicating with her past lives, right, she'll ask Aang, like, Aang, why did you want to kind of lock me away and train me? Like, I thought you were very free and stuff. And Aang would be like, uh, I didn't want that for you. <laughs> like, I wanted you to be you. Just, you know, the after I was supposed to travel the world. And then she'd go to her dad and be like, so you guys have been lying to me? Hey, like, yo, I talked to yeah. the previous Avatar. You might know him. <laughs> and he said that said that you guys <laughs> made this decision. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that that puts Korra kind of rightfully mad at her dad for lying to her. Um, 
so you know he'll he'll be like, well, me and the White Lotus thought that it would be better for you to to train, just you know, just locked up and locked away and stuff. Like there was so many threats, Cora, and you might be asking yourself like, oh, well, why don't they mention the threat of the Red Lotus? Because that's in my head, that's the real reason why they locked her away because the Red Lotus kidnapped her at like the age of four, and uh, but I think the real the the way you explain that he doesn't try to explain the Red Lotus to her is that he does something awful at that time also. Like maybe he goes overboard and kills um, like one of the his close friends or something. Not his girlfriend because that's too close. Um, but maybe like a, a teacher. No, no, him. that's too strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's this. Um, and, he, and he regrets that and that's kind of ruined him spiritually. And, and that's also another act of aggression he did on top of the going after the spirits in uh, in the in the North Pole. Uh, and so like to to him, that's a part of him that he wants to forget and he never wants to bring up again. So that way you can write that in to explain that they don't mention the red lotus. Um because and because that would be an easy way to explain to Cora, like, hey the red lotus will try to kidnap you. That's why we locked you away. But you you just you just he just tells Cora that it's a there was threats and stuff. But she'll still be like, no, you lied to me. And so that would cause rift in their relationship. That would that would come off more organic, uh, reasonable, uh, yeah, believable. More, <laughs> yeah, would. Yeah, would. Um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna I, be I, John I would, Mulaney this episode while you talk. Okay, that's completely fine. Um, so that would explain explain kind of their relationship to tyranny, and then they still have a matter of Okay. So that's kind of how you make, I think, Cora less annoying in that, and especially those early on episodes. What if Janet um, Varney I'll... listens to this episode? Do you think she would ever call Cora annoying on her podcast, Chris? One thing, I think Janet Varney is hard on Cora herself. In, in a way, not in, not in like usual typical fashion. I, 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 she loves Cora, no doubt about it. Like she absolutely adores Cora. But I say she's hard in the way that she often, I feel like she she lowers Cora to uplift Aang, right? She'll be like, you know, Aang is Aang is great and stuff. <laughs> um, but she also <laughs> she also gets into like fan interactions. I think sometimes where where uh, she she defends Cora to a certain extent. But I think she sees that Cora is also can be like abrasive at times. I mean, she she knows this. What? But. But uh, yeah, Cora, Cora, uh, Jenny Ronnie loves Cora. <laughs> um, okay, so for the most part, the story will kind of remain the same after after uh, between episodes like three and uh, three and seven. I think Harmonic Convergence starts, uh, or the beginning starts on like episode seven. And I think yeah, things will stay relatively the same. Um, I would keep. Unalak relatively the same. So once you get to harmonic convergence, I think there needs to be a little bit of of just further explaining harmonic convergence and the kind of what's at what's on line. So you kind of say that harmonic convergence is also a time of great spiritual moment that can be filled with unexpected good or bad consequences, um, kind of resulting from the fight between. Um, <clears throat> Ravan Vatu, and this is only there to set up a reasoning or some excuse why Airbenders came back, <laughs> right? Because it's not really explaining like they just say harmonic convergence, and <laughs> but if you say like, oh, well, harmonic convergence is such this like radical thing that like spiritual energy just all over the place, yes. <laughs> is it harmonic convergence that resulted in Airbenders coming back, or is it opening of the spirit portals in general? Well, both. The okay. opening of spirit portals allowed harmonic convergence to happen. Intriguing. Okay. Yes. Um, so, like, they could explain, like, oh, well, the spiritual energies of the airbenders were kind of floating. Like, they never, they never had anything to reincarnate to. So, the harmonic convergence took that energy and put it into other people. Just that way, you can, you can, you can save that and use it for later to explain why there might be airbenders instead they just say harmonic convergence um 
and grant you know they could do a better job of, of writing some of of that but just it's just to help explain it i guess can it also have a different name <laughs> huh. i hate I never the really name about... harmonic convergence so we got the uh like in avatar the last airbender we got the what is it called the the solstice and yeah. the what's the, the day other of one? Uh, they have day of black sun black day of black sun so those they just like they kind of make sense right away um with sort of planetary or or astrological terms and things that we that we know and understand yeah. and the the astrological mm. component still exists for harmonic yeah. convergence right like there's that some planet true. alignment or something like that it's like can't they what just, is that called right can't what is, is, I, is that called something in real life i i would I, think so but surely it's so infrequent and in, that you know that maybe we just didn't take enough astrology classes in college <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking there's something about the name harmonic convergence that just feels i mean i say made up it's fiction i i'm aware of that <laughs> but it just feels extra made up whereas like the solstice like all right sol- solstice real deal sun firebenders get power sun good makes sense i don't know it just fits together yeah it's called it's just called planetary alignment Damn. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't sounds... lend itself very well. <laughs> the day of alignment has come. I like alignment because I feel like alignment of the can sort of be used as in the physical world uh, aligning as one yeah. or something like that. Yeah, like something. I feel like alignment is is kind of a cinnamon cinnamon It's a for, cinnamon of... <laughs> for uh, like reconciliation. Mm. Or, or something along that line. So I, I think I like the word alignment. We can work um, with this s- spiritual alignment, but but it has to be more grand than that. Yeah. Um, grand alignment. I don't know. Um, Even harmonic alignment sounds better than harmonic convergence. I think so. Sure, harmonic alignment. That's still. I'm not loving it, but I think we're close. I don't we're getting know. closer. Yeah. But I, I think I get what you're saying about harmonic harmonic convergence. Is it's not relatable yeah. like previous planetary uh, and or these these previous phenomenon. phenomenon I guess harmonic have been. I guess harmonic is sort of like alignment, right? Because oh, we're in harmony. We're in huh. yeah. So, and then convert harmonic. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's something to ponder. Help I us guess. out, other Avatar fans. Help the word <laughs> harmonic convergence, the phrase, what sound is it? more <laughs> interesting and less like something that Unalak made up, like on a car ride. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the next thing that I think really needs to be... So, going along, uh, this is, I think, one of the one of the worst parts of this season to me. And that is the 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 Varric, Mako, Bolin, Asami storyline. I I found this to be the weakest because I feel like so many characters' relationship really regressed, and that was really <laughs> annoying to me because they came such a long way. Um, oh, and add uh, add Lin to that. So I would have it to where Mako is still framed, but when he's framed that one time, Asami is like, no, there's no way. That, that Mako did this. One thing, none of them should be thinking he did it anyway because they know Mako. And so they shouldn't just be like nonchalantly going along with everything and not, not trying like to fight this. immediately presume that he's a psychopath. And... Yeah. And so I do think Bolin would kind of keep going on with because Bolin is is getting to know Varric pretty closely. It's like, Varric, Varric is goofy, yeah, and eccentric, but I don't think he would set up Mako. But still be like... But Mako's kind of on to him. Um, I, I just wouldn't make him so, like, doofusly just not caring. About, it seemed like he just didn't care about Mako's strife. Like, make him sympathetic towards Mako, but make him still, oh, try and get close to Varric, maybe for his own, uh, just look at it and stuff. And <clears throat> just because he trusts Varric, and maybe he's just like, you know what? I don't think it's Varric, but... I believe Mako that something's going on, so I'll, I'll just kind of keep going with Varric and and dig deeper to find out who's really behind this. So he'll still be in the movers and everything, and that's why because I 
I like him as a mover. I like this story element a little bit. Um, I guess I like it for for Bolin because it I think it feeds into his character. Um, for Asami wise though, I think Asami she goes into detective mode. <laughs> she she starts piecing. She she takes the mantle from Mako and starts piecing things together, but not just piecing things together like he was, but actually having proof and everything. And then I think she um, assembles. Um, like mech suits and everything, and it kind of has a very one v kind of one versus a whole Varix army essentially. Uh, she figures it out, and then her and and uh, Lynn goes and takes them all out because Lynn is also like, I trust Mako. Like, sure, I there's no evidence to help support him, and and as a and as a cop, I can't arrest Varric and stuff, but I'm gonna go. You know, kind of incognito with 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 Asami, and so those two together kind of take out Varric, and and makes it more personal that they they kind of take him out, um, kind of right there, maybe in his factory or something, or they take out the people at his factory, and then Bolin takes out some of the other henchmen, and eventually they, everything converges at the stadium, and they all arrest Varric. Uh, I think this, I think fits in this, just fits this, a lot of the character relationship regression that happened in, in book two. It also gets Asami and Lin more to do because they were very sidelined, uh, I think, for this season. Are you comfortable with, like, I think certain characters, not certain, I think a certain amount of regression from a character as like an arc or as part of a character's arc would be okay. Uh, but I think yeah. the sort of breadth of occurrence across the board here is is unsettling. But if you if you had to like leave one of those people and say, "Hey, this person just going through an arc where they're having a rough time," and 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 you know leads to some some bad character work, uh, which would that would be? Which would you which would you leave if I twisted your arm? Um. Which way I'll leave between what now? Give me a character that gets to keep their regression, okay. but in that oh. could be built into a better gotcha. like arc for that character. So instead of just hey, all these characters are going to regress, it's like no, uh, you know, this this regression mm. of Mako really is uh, is a real thing, and it's something that needs yeah. addressed for him emotionally or, or or something like that. Huh. Um. Huh. Just. Generally the trying to make the point that the yeah. regression itself isn't bad. It's just the fact that it's kind of happening across the board for yeah. kind of yeah. inexplicable reasons. Uh, I get what you're saying. Um, the Asami one, I think. Because I think you could say that, but yeah, Asami dealt with her. You know, She thought she knew her father. And her father ended up betraying her. And then, you know, then Mako betrays her. So that doesn't surprise her. So she can't. She she learns to not trust anybody, essentially. She's like, yeah, this is my life. Like this is, this is uh, people betray me apparently, and 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 this is it. Um, that's fair, and it's easy. It really is maybe the easiest story to paint around here that feels empathetic to us as watchers for her to yeah. quote unquote regress. Okay, yeah, just making a point yeah. or attempting to make a point. Yeah. No, char- and character regression, like you said, is characters' growth is not a, a linear thing. <laughs> uh, Chorus growth or Zigo's growth, growth wasn't just like, all right, I'm at point A, and then I made it to point Z, and just a quick thing. Now you go from point C back to B to F, all the way back to D, and finally you make it to Z. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll well, actually, you just make it to Y, and you're always growing. You always have something to improve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. I was gonna make a comment about uh, it's you make it to Y, and then if you're Zuko, you drop back to like E, maybe G, <laughs> something like yeah. that. He he was. <laughs> I feel like he was at X, and then book uh, crossroads of destiny happened, and then he went back to A. <laughs> It's like he started inventing new letters to go off on the side, yeah. <laughs> perpendicular or what? He just bad tangents. Yeah, started um, using okay. Roman numerals and shit. Oh yeah. Uh, and then the final thing I would change, which is, I think some of the 
Lazy is writing a book two is just explain what Janora is doing. <laughs> like we said this before. Uh, <laughs> like it it needed explain it because she just comes in with something something looks like it's in her hand and she spreads it and then and she then somehow, seems to know what she's doing. Yeah. Nobody else does. And no one says what she does. It's Not never even related creator. to us. <laughs> Not even in the commentary. The cre- the creators, you know, I've said this before, that at one point Brian is asked in the commentary, Brian's asking Mike, like, hey, Mike, what's Janora doing there? He's like, I don't know. He's kidding saying it. But then he goes on to explain, like, yeah, I mean, what she's doing is sort of just like kind of reawakening Rava a, a little bit. But that is, it's, if that's what she's doing. It's unclear. So just in my head, you just say, Janora, when, when, when she, when Tenzin gets her out of the fog of lost souls, she's like, Dad, I have, I have something to do. Like, I just have her explain it there. So I just like, I know I can help. Like, Rob has been destroyed, but the light's never fully destroyed. I can reawaken the light. Just boom. Just do, just, just say that. Have That's Janora funny. go down. It's perfect. <laughs> and just just have Janora shine her light because Janora, I feel like you could say like light recognizes other other like part of Rava is that Rava is, is fueled a little bit by just the light and people and have Janora shine her beautiful spiritual light and that reawakens Rava, kind of upstarts her growth a little bit and that way boom, Cora can see it and, she, and then Cora knows that that light is still there and she can find it and rip it out. Somehow Janora reveals to. like the glimmer that still exists of Rava. Somehow more explicable. Yes. But and maybe that's one of those things that they put in there and then you know they put in the script because they're always kind of short on time they're figuring out like what to cut. But it still I think could have really been used to explain because I defend Legend of Korra like so much to people, but then I'm like, there's two things I can't really because sometimes they're like, oh, it has like so many plot holes and, and stuff like this. And like, it doesn't have that many plot holes. Like, but there's two that can't explain that well. One is what was Janora doing and, and why did Harmonic Convergence lead to Airbenders? Like, you can sort of explain the two, but it's... it's Just uh, in the generic spirit world yeah. stuff and, way. Yeah, and the regular Avatar has... I, actually, I think the first series has bigger writing issues and oh we should get into that one day uh, <laughs> a seat kind of opened up a can of worms I, I... <laughs> like there's there's two huge i think glaring holes and actually they both involve ang <laughs> in the series but and, and and i just now i think notice this i don't know in our reviewing and so just some more you kind of look at it but uh, yeah, they just have a few things that, that aren't really explained why this is that and stuff. But these are like really, I feel like those aren't I don't know, as big of plot points, but these are pretty big plot well, points. Well, and let's, there again, just not not explained and, and bad writing don't don't have to go hand in hand. But in this case, it, it, it has like a certain amount of lazy or incomplete feeling to it is what is, what is being called out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so those are the things that I would change in book two. I would keep the Korra and Mako relationship pretty much just the way it is. Because even though it, it's messy, I think it's somewhat realistic. And I like how they came to the conclusion that they should not be together. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I liked all of that. Um, oh, a lot of people hate the big fight at the end there. I, I love it. I really have no qualms with it. Uh, you know, it's it's a little uh, it's a little Michael Bay ish for me, but I like it. Yeah. Big um, big shiny oversized. Yeah. City if anything, I would <laughs> in a weird way. I would I would <laughs> I would go the opposite direction and and make it more just outlandish spirit as i was say they are spirits we had the whole world of creativity open to us here and we chose giant spirits but you yeah. know I, okay i don't i don't have a better idea for that off the top of my head so i get it yeah. it, it could have been like this sort of surreal insane 
but then again, how do you animate those two words that I just said? Yeah. Uh, so, Chris, what you've just done is you painted a very nice detailed picture uh, of some improvements to book two. And that's good. When when we send in the script <laughs> to Hollywood, we're going to put your name on it, not mine, because it's the right thing to do. And it's going to be this script. But I spent some time thinking about the things that I don't like about book two <laughs> and how to get rid of them. And this is what I came up with. So just go through this real quick. It's <laughs> dumb rewrite. Don't overthink this too much at all, because you want to talk about plot holes, mine's full of them. First of all, no, <laughs> there's no <laughs> harmonic <laughs> convergence. The early episodes mostly stay the same, at least in terms of plot. Relationship, character things, you know, those could use some brushing up, but plot mostly stays the same. Uh, so essentially, Unalak... Uh, is going to convince Korra in a pretty similar manner to open the spirit portals. Like, hey, this is just the right way. It's the way it's supposed to be. We've neglected this for too long. Uh, so somehow or other, he's going to convince her. I thought about saying tricked, but in the end, it's not tricked, because in the end, it kind of is the right thing to do. But it's going to take Unalak convincing her. Uh, so then some amount of chaos ensues that we do already experience within the season. Some, uh, Some... I'm going to say somewhat expected, like Unalak can even warn, say, hey, it's going to cost some weird stuff, but it's going to be better for everybody. But then somehow, and this is where we get to the climax of the season, is somehow then we need Unalak to trick Korra into freeing Vatu from the ancient tree. I don't know how that's going to happen, but it needs to happen somehow. This is where the Unalak sweet talking has got to happen. And But this is what Unalak had planned all along. Like He wanted to have the spirit portals open, he knew that Vatu is in the tree, and once he gets Vatu out, then he and Vatu can still uh, can still merge and grow super powerful. Um, and then Korra loses that initial fight. She goes back to the tree. She learns this long history of of uh, Vatu and Rava. Uh, gets mad, powers back up, goes back in, saves the world. Ten episodes rather than twelve. There's some filler stuff in there. I'd get rid of. And also no romantic okay. drama at all. Let's just get rid of all that. You can have <laughs> you can have couples, just no drama. Uh, all, <laughs> this is all built around like, all right, could you make it work without harmonic convergence? The answer is no, not particularly well. What I've crafted here has way more holes and things in it. <laughs> um, but uh, I did like the idea that opening the spirit portals, like I said, in the beginning it feels like a bad thing, but then in the end it turns out to kind of be the right thing or that they buy into it they own it they go with it uh and so trying to make that the focal point as opposed to the harmonic convergence as the focal point didn't really figure out how to do that in my head but i was like can i get rid of harmonic convergence maybe maybe not um maybe maybe harmonic convergence does just need a little extra naming tlc and a little extra <laughs> explanation maybe that's all <laughs> and less romantic drama damn high schoolers and your feelings. I feel like you gotta break up Mako and Bola. Not Mako and Bola. You gotta break up Mako and Korra. Uh, fine, whatever. Well, give no, me that one. I mean, I, I could get the that, that Mako and Asami don't get back together. Uh, cause that, that adds a lot to the to the drama. It does, uh, and it's, yeah. it's kind of filler-y in its own right yeah. like it's pretty like it's unnecessary it doesn't lead to much so yeah you can toss that one out the window maybe uh maybe bolin wouldn't have to be romantically stupid you could toss out some of that part ah oh, but that stuff is funny yeah uh, funny for like the very first time you're like yeah he really doesn't get it but then he keeps digging in you're like all right that's <laughs> that's that's too bad. it's like steve carell when it goes like a, in the office when something goes farther than it should and it stops being funny that's what bolin and his his bits with the the redhead lady i forget her name yeah i forgot I'm, I'm sure it's important but anyway long story short book two spirits is a good season chris loves it i very like it <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 sticking with a four four stars out of five. Just uh, out of five. Oh, yeah, out of, yeah, right. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you know stars, we usually yeah. do out of ten. You're right. So okay, I'll stick with eight. <laughs> I guess that puts Chris in the nine territory. Is that what it equates yeah. to? nine equates although, to love? Although if you although if you break it, that's on that's on a 
a favorite to them ranking. Yeah, that's it. That's the uh, biased be, ranking. Yeah, it'll be interesting once we compare it to the other seasons. Because I, I gave us some little grades. I gave a couple episodes some little grades. It is. It, because of the way things average out, I don't imagine it'll be drastically different. But I, I'm willing to bet that mathematically it's lower on average and with sort of a lower range overall. I'd be yeah. willing to bet that, so... I don't know. We'll see. We'll dig into that at the end of our of all of our Quora seasons and maybe even bring in some ATLA seasons. See what yep. average episode ratings look like. Uh, we're strangest, things like that. It'll be fun. In the meantime, if you can help us fill in some of these plot holes and maybe add some of these improvements to season two, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your opinions on what you might do to improve it. Uh, or if you like it just the way it is, tell us why that is. We'd love to hear that as well. Because I'm sure mm. there's people out there that <laughs> hated that that I don't love it. And that's great. I, I mean, can't wait to hear I appreciate comments. that. Especially Kaylin. Well. I feel like Kaylin's going to come with something. She's gonna, oh, I feel yeah, like she's she been always, thinking about it. She always delivers uh, great detail as well. So, <laughs> yeah, let us know your thoughts. We'd appreciate hearing them. In the meantime, I think we've we've done our work here. Chris, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I do not. Thanks for putting up with our uh, slightly abbreviated episodes. We appreciate your patience. And my name's Sean Taylor. That's Chris Ford, a.k.a. The Objective Geek of YouTube and Twitter. I'll put lots of ways that you can interact with us down in the description. And thank you so much for watching Avatar The Last Podcasters. We'll see you next time. Ha, <laughs>